Lynn, your, the mic is yours. Anyway, um, I wanted to thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm probably the only person in the room who could barely spell synthetic biology six months ago, but I've been living through a little bit of a reality show as I have a grad student now who's um, been drinking the Kool-Aid, and so therefore here I am drinking the Kool-Aid as well. Um, what I'm going to do today is talk about the limits for life on Earth. Um, I am an evolutionary biologist, so I'll try to summarize in um, half an hour the uh, 4.2 billion years or so head start that evolution has on you. Um, but I think really the subtext has to be what can um, evolutionary biology contribute to synthetic biology. Um, so I'm going to divide this more or less into um, four parts, although the first two will be intermingled. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of my stump speech on the limits to life on Earth. Um, just going to have to give a little bit of the highlights because obviously I can't cover the entire diversity of life on Earth in just a few moments. Um, but then focus at the end a little bit on how evolutionary approach might enrich synthetic biology and maybe where synthetic biology is going, at least in terms of what we're interested in um, in the space agency. Now, many of you have probably heard about extremophiles, and many people associate extremophiles with high temperature archaea, and I'm going to argue that that is really grossly unfair. The reason something is extreme is not because it lives in some place that we find unpleasant without air conditioning or heating. It's because life is based on organic carbon. And so any environment that makes it difficult to keep your body intact, to keep organic carbon intact, is a priori going to be extreme. Um, why carbon? Well, carbon is the fourth most common element in the universe, um, capable of forming a vast array of compounds ranging from methane to DNA and beyond. And those silicon people in the room, it's not that I, I can't imagine silicon-based life, but by the time you start to develop any sort of complexity, you're starting to talk a organic carbon decoration again. And the fact is that we're sitting here on a very large silicate rock, and we're not made of silicon. There are many days that I feel my brain is made of silicon, but that's sort of a second generation issue, not a first generation. Um, and finally, and this is, I think, one of the most stunning things that we've learned in astrobiology over the last few decades, is that if you look into interstellar space, it isn't this great vacuum that we thought it was. And then, you know, the radicals thought, well, maybe there's a little nitrogen there or something. But it's much more interesting than that. Um, our colleagues have found organic chemistry going on even in the interstellar medium. And what you find out there are some of the same building blocks for life on Earth. And so the sort of depressing thing for people who struggled through organic chemistry in school is that the organic chem book that you used on planet Earth may be, in essence, the same one that is used by students around Alpha Centauri or whatever. This may, in fact, be the language of biology throughout the universe. Certainly, there could be differences in terms of genetic material. It doesn't need to be DNA-based, RNA-based. Um, there are certainly many more amino acids that can be used, although, again, the simple ones that we use on Earth are found out there in the interstellar medium or certainly have been modeled um, out there by using um, experimental um, interstellar chemistry chambers on the Earth simulating those conditions. So let's start with the assumption that what we're living here is really the language of life in the universe. Um, and so therefore, the environmental extremes that we posit for Earth are really going to be the environmental extremes for life um, per se. Now, I'm going to show you this in a, in a chart in a moment, but I think it's more fun to sort of discuss some of these environmental extremes in a visual way. This is a picture by Lake Bogoria in the Rift Valley in Kenya, where you've got the highest pH lakes in the world. This is kind of a cool place because it's not only very high pH, but you can see it's boiling water and also a high saline environment. And so this makes it unusual, well, if not unique, certainly very different from Yellowstone, which is very low pH boiling water, and yet there are organisms in there. So let's just use that as a nice backdrop to talk about the extremes of temperature. That's something that's very easy for us to imagine. We'll talk about that in more detail. Um, pH, once again, you've got the extremes of pH make it very difficult for organic compounds to stay intact, and even more so in the case of pH, to be functional. Um, desiccation is going to be a problem because we're organic chemists that use water as a solvent. And so if we get rid of the solvent, we've got problems. Even if we bring the solute con solvent concentration down and therefore the solute concentration up, we've got problems. Now, I made a case that we would see organic carbon anywhere in the universe. Um, I'm not going to make as strong a case that we would see 
water as the solvent anywhere else. I think there are good reasons, certainly in our local solar system, to imagine that water is a very likely solvent with the possible exception of looking for life on Titan. But I'm not going to argue that quite as strongly. But certainly for life on Earth, desiccation is a very, very serious extreme environment. Salinity, again, just think about what happens in a lab when you dump salt into a, a biochemical reaction. You get all sorts of problems. Chemical extremes, we'll talk very, very briefly about life that can live in high levels of arsenic or pure CO2 and so on. Um, pressure. Again, we don't tend to think about pressure, but as I'm sure many people here know, there have been organisms that have been found down to the bottom of the ocean. So they're living in enormous pressure. Some of these organisms are fine when you bring them up to the surface. Some of them are not. They're exquisitely adapted to these very high pressures. Um, we, in my own research, have started to do some um, high-altitude ballooning, which is so incredibly fun, I can't tell you. And so I took all the slides out so that I wouldn't get distracted. But when you start going up from the surface of the Earth, you've got a completely different sorts of pressure problems, not to mention desiccation and so on. Radiation, and this is where most of my actual research is um, these days. Solar radiation, ionizing radiation, and secondarily, um, the major effect from radiation after the direct effects would be oxidative damage. And that's going to have all sorts of problems that we can talk about a little bit later. And there's um, just a, a nice visual to show that even though we use oxidative um, processes, and thank goodness we do because we wouldn't be the large mammals we are, we wouldn't even be animals without aerobic metabolism, that in fact you are playing with fire. And literally it's playing with fire when you're aerobic. Um, electricity I throw in just because I wouldn't want to go swimming with an electric eel. So let me just take a few minutes to just do something much more lighthearted than these really brilliant talks that we've been hearing the last few days. And that's to show you some of the pictures about these sorts of environments that we're talking about. Um, but first, let me show a little bit of a taxonomic spread. And I started by making the point that high temperature archaea are not synonymous with extremophiles. And this just hammers that point in. Um, I just drew on this tree that I got from Norm Pace's lab. Um, some of the groups that we know for a fact have extremophiles in it. There are probably many, many more. So you find them all throughout, including the eukaryotes. We tend to minimize the eukaryotes. And as a eukaryote, and I suspect most people in this room are eukaryotes as well, we have to have a little feeling of chauvinism here. Here's a tardigrade, which is probably the champion animal at this point. Um, it's a little tiny microscopic invertebrate. Um, it's also known as a water bear. Many of them can go into what's called a tun state, where they're highly desiccated. And in this condition, they're extremely resistant to just about anything you can throw at them, from temperature to radiation to you know, nearly anything. There was a, a little piece that came out a couple of weeks ago that got a lot of press, a Swedish group that flew some tardigrades um, up on one of the uh, European satellites and was able to have them survive. Um, it certainly would be something that you would expect. If, if one animal is going to be champ and be able to survive these incredible extremes, it would be tardigrades, at least in the ton state. And so I have to give a little advertisement. I have a new postdoc from Japan who's been one of the first to be able to culture these so we can start to see whether they can survive these sorts of assaults and then go through multiple generations, as you really need to in biology um, if you're going to be successful in a Darwinian sense. This is sort of what I was talking about in, in one of the um, you know, graphical forms, if you like having long charts. Um, and this just gives you a little bit of a plug. A lot of this was summarized in a paper that I had um, with Rocco Mancinelli in Nature in 2001. And then we've got subsequent papers. So if anyone's interested in seeing this in a more um, cohesive form with many more references, email me. I'd be happy to get you the references. Um, say, I'm not really, I, I feel awful because I'm not really going to be able to talk about my own research. But suffice it to say that the reason NASA hires an evolutionary biologist such as myself, because we have an interest in what happens during evolution, because quite honestly, there's only one planet we found life so far. Of course, that's planet Earth. Um, and then within that, I've been focusing a lot on particular physical characteristic, um, high levels of um, ultraviolet radiation, say secondarily ionizing radiation, oxidative damage. Um, and then finally, of course, at NASA, we're very interested in looking for life elsewhere and whether life from Earth can go forward um, beyond Earth and to other planets, probably not other solar systems, but at least other planets. And so this week work, as um, Jeannie very kindly said, has taken me all over the world. In fact, I'm going to be in the Rift Valley in Kenya next week. 
Um, and so what I'm going to do is show you some of these extremophile sites, again, sort of a lighthearted few minutes so you can put away your pencils or pens or, or whatever um, and just sort of enjoy this. And um, we're going to switch around from these various sites, and that's why I show you this so you can get all the bad news at once. Um, this isn't going to be very coherent. So the temperature limits for life, we've got all sorts of places we can go, but this basically gives an idea of the range. Um, we have reports of Himalayan midges who are active at minus 17 degrees. We have reports of bacteria that are active even a few degrees lower than that. It's not completely clear to me how to interpret some of that, um, some of those papers. Um, we certainly know that there are penguins that are metabolically active well below that. And you know, oddly enough, I've had people say, you know, I'll say penguins, and they'll say, oh, but they're cheating. They've got feathers. Well, um, yeah, this is real life. There's no book that says, I'm sorry, if you produce feathers, that doesn't count as an extremophile. The fact is, the life on Earth has figured out how to beat this odds of zero degrees very easily. And then conversely, I'm sure you're well aware that there are organisms that we have found up um, 121 degrees is a good solid uh, number. There have been reports a little bit higher than that, but um, 121 you can probably take to the bank. And in this case, these are the archaea. At the very low temperature, you've got a range of organisms. And if you're just talking about survival, of course, we freeze human embryos in liquid nitrogen. So that's no big deal. What we're really talking about is metabolic activity here. Um, and so what do we mean? I mean, these, these guys aren't even really anywhere near the champs, but I happen to have this nice picture. We've got plenty of organisms that live in snow, um, snow algae. They tend to be green algae or diatoms and so on that have lots of red pigments, carotenoids, to protect themselves from the sun and the oxidative damage. Um, this is commonly known as watermelon snow. And then the opposite extreme, you have these very high temperature organisms. This is octopus springs in Yellowstone National Park. And if you, you tilt your head a little bit to the left, it sort of looks like an octopus with the tentacles. The source is above the boiling temperature of water, but it's got archaea in it, bacteria as well. Um, Yellowstone's at about 7,000 feet or so, and so the boiling temperature of water is closer to 95 here. Um, when you cool off just a hair down to 83, you can see the thermocrinus rubare there um, grows very quickly. It's nothing tricky about it. You can put string across this little stream, and in a day or two, you see these pinkish mats. It's incredible. Um, and then you, you know, even down 65, you have a very lush microbial mat. So there's nothing tricky about these temperatures. I mean, it's tricky, but it's not prohibitively tricky. You see many, many organisms that are able to survive that. And to put it back in perspective, um, one day I'd spent far too long there doing DNA damage experiments and photosynthesis, and I accidentally stepped in that narrow outflow at the bottom. And you have never seen anyone take a boot off so fast. I mean, compared to 121, sure, 83 seems pretty cool. But believe me, it is, as we say, damn hot. And that's about the summary of it. So this really is remarkable. Um, one other point in this picture, for those of you who haven't been to Yellowstone, this is a very short walk from Mushroom Springs, which is where um, Thermos aquatus was first isolated. So very important in the history of molecular biology. pH limits for life. Um, what you see over on the left is Congress Springs, and this is where Tom Brock first um, discovered some of these organisms like Sulfolobus. Very, very low pH. It can get down to near zero there and boiling. So again, you're talking about organisms living in boiling battery acid, and yet you see organisms from several taxonomic groups, including eukaryotes, that seem to be able to live at these extremely low pHs. Um, we're probably going to find organisms below pH zero as people start to go out into the field with pH meters that actually can go below zero. I see some quizzical looks. Think back to what pH actually means. You're telling the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. You can go below pH zero. Conversely, as I mentioned, in Africa, in the Rift Valley, in Tanzania, and in Kenya, you get the highest pH lakes in the world. We know that there are organisms up around pH 12 or so because these lakes are at that pH. It is nearly impossible to keep a culture at that pH in the lab. But we see these lakes. Again, it's nothing exotic. It's not something out of science fiction. You see the flamingos. You see you know, people walking there in the background. You certainly see plenty of cyanobacteria there. Um, here's another low pH site. And Again, backtracking a little bit, this is pH 2.5, so that's nothing compared to pH zero. I'm standing in it, doesn't bother me. And you can see that it's, it's absolutely full 
of organisms. In this case, it's a, basically a three-component system. You see these cyanidium, which are red algae, although they don't have any of the red pigment, which is why it looks green. Some acidophilic chlorella, which is a green alga, and some dactylaria, which is a fungus. So you see that this pH 2.5, and this is about 40 degrees centigrade, is certainly not challenging even for these eukaryotes. Um, again, these high pH, high temperature. I'm not quite sure how many, how I got quite so many Kenya pictures in there. Let's shift gears for a second to halophiles. These are organisms that live in very high salt concentrations. Um, they tend to produce a lot of carotenoids, again, to protect themselves from oxidative damage. Um, what you see here is a picture taken in one of the evaporation ponds at the Cargill Salt Company in South San Francisco Bay. Some of it's being decommissioned. You can see from that Landsat image right above the NASA meatball logo, this reddish area, and then the blow up of my research associate, uh, Dana Rogoff, taking a sample there. Um, at these very high salt concentrations, you're concentrating halophiles, and so you get these red colors. Anyone who's flown to San Francisco, I'm sure, has seen this. Um, again, remarkable that these organisms can live at these salinities. You're talking about sort of roughly five molar sodium chloride here. This is very, very high saline conditions. Um, we've worked on organisms that are trapped in solid salt and evaporites. And these organisms tend to be extremely resistant to radiation. In fact, we've flown some of them also on a European satellite and exposed them to the environment in space and were able to bring them back to the lab with a certain percentage of survival. These are very tough, and if you think about it, um, it's because halophiles tend to be desiccation resistant. Not all desiccation resistant organisms are halophiles, but halophiles tend to be desiccation resistant. Why should that be correlated with radiation resistance? Well, if you think about it, when you're desiccated, you're not metabolically active, and therefore, when you come out of desiccation, you've got an accumulation of damage, and you have to be able to repair that very quickly and then go about your business from there, and so there seems to be a good correlation. That's probably why Donococcus radiodurans is as tough as it is. Um, and you can go to all sorts of sites where you see desiccation. This is, um, happens to be a site that we've done a lot of work on at about um, 15,000 feet up in the Bolivian Andes. You can see it's very, very dry, um, so obviously desiccated. There's not a whole lot of oxygen. We take Diamox starting a couple of days before we go there, um, but it's you know, it's one of those places that's starkly gorgeous. Um, so these organisms are going through a couple of different assaults. Um, one of the things that they are also suffering from up in the Bolivian Andes, which is why we started going there, is very high levels of ultraviolet radiation. We could get into why it's particularly high there. But this is to remind you that ultraviolet radiation is probably one of the worst environmental extremes because we've got this situation that we're built on organic molecules, particularly proteins, um, lipids, and, of course, nucleic acids, all of which absorb strongly in the UV. So any time that you're getting anywhere near um, dosages that are near those wavelengths for peak absorption, 280 for proteins, 260 for um, nucleic acids, you're having all sorts of problems. And um, because this is so dangerous, evolution has provided multiple ways to protect us. And so it's not just a single situation that you might be thinking about in a synthetic situation, but you've, it, it is so important to organisms that you, you go through backup system after backup system. Not every organism has every one of these backup systems, but we all have a couple of them. Um, finally, I'd, I'd want to mention the high oxygen. Um, we get oxidative damage partly because we're aerobic organisms, so we're playing with all these oxygen radicals. Um, photosynthetic organisms are also going through the same sort of problem if they're doing oxygenic photosynthesis, except in reverse. Um, furthermore, UVA as well as UVB can produce these oxygen radicals, so you're getting it from your normal metabolism, you're getting it from um, production from solar radiation. And this is also extremely dangerous because, again, oxygen radicals, particularly things like hydroxyl radical, are extremely dangerous for lipids, nucleic acids, and proteins. And so you've got to really think about that when you're talking about environmental extremes, too. And so this really surprises our geologist friends when I say that, in fact, for life, you probably are better off in some place like Mars that's anaerobic because you don't have to worry about all these oxygen radicals. So I've given you a little bit of what my, my, um, my assignment was on um, the extremes for life. So what I, I wanted to do, having sat here for two days, 
is to give a little bit of, of my talk back. I know a couple of people made comments about, you know, evolutionary biologists, you know, you, it, we're going to really, you know, revolutionize biology by using a synthetic approach. Um, so I'm sort of representing all us old fuddy duddies fighting back for, for one second. Um, so let's start with common ground. I've noticed that a lot of these talks are really focusing on carbon chemistry. And that's what biology is all about because we're based on organic carbon. Um, and that, for that reason, life is the superior organic chemist, synthetic organic chemist. And I think that's something that everyone here is aware of at some level or another or else you wouldn't be involved in synthetic biology. Um, and of course, organic compounds are the ones that are for the most part most interesting um, in, a, in an economic sense. They're not the only ones that are interesting, of course, but they certainly are extremely important in terms of food, pharmaceuticals, fuels, and so on. Again, there's nothing I'm saying here that everyone here doesn't know. Um, I want to make this point loud and clear. Evolution, though, is a tinker. It's not an engineer. Um, I recommend, if you haven't read Francois Jacob's article that was in Science in 1977, he la lays out a certain number of um, these points. And the point is that you can't think of evolution as an engineer. It's certainly not a synthetic biologist type engineer. Evolution is a tinker. You've got to think of evolution like someone who's sitting in their garage saying, well, you know, I could take that bicycle and um, if I add this part and I add this part, let's see what happens. It doesn't even sit there and say, I wonder what parts I need to add to the bicycle to make it fly. You just start adding parts, and it may work and it may not. And if you do it again the next day, you may end up in a completely different route. You use what's, you have no initial design in evolution. It's not teleological. You use what's available. For example, you duplicate genes or, you know, if, again, think of someone in their garage, you use what's there. Um, this may result in a novel function, which we call in evolutionary biology, exaptation. For example, wings originally were probably used for something very different from flying. Feathers were probably used for different things, hair, and so on. Um, progress is iterative. You may end up going in circles. It's not a well-designed process, um, but somehow it works. I mean, the fact is somehow we're all here talking in, you know, in a large lecture theater. Um, different attempts to solve this, a certain problem may have very different solutions, and this is what we call convergence. Again, this you know very obvious example is there are many ways to build a wing to fly. Insects and um, bats and birds and so on have all arrived at the similar sort of solution, but from very different starting points and in de very different pathways. Every one of these stages is under selection, and this is something where there's maybe a little difference with synthetic biology. Once again, um, I was reminded of this the other day when I was speaking to um, Rudy Rapp at Indiana University who feels that many of the invertebrates when they first arose did not have larval stages, that actually the larval stages were tacked on later and that's something that's counterintuitive I think to many of us. Um, so again, all stages are under selection and evolution, not just the final product. And the criterion for success is reproduction. You've got to be a Darwinian success. Um, Biology is nonlinear, and this, this really is just an excuse to show one piece of data. One of the things that we've done is go out quite a bit into these environments and look at, um, say, radiation damage and oxidative damage. In this particular experiment, what we are doing is going back to Nymph Creek and Yellowstone and adding different concentrations of hydrogen peroxide to look at the reaction. And what you see immediately from this data, without even really knowing what I'm talking about, is that it's nonlinear that when you add a little bit of hydrogen peroxide, you get an increase, and in, in this case, it's uptake of radioactive phosphate into the DNA. A little bit more, you get a decrease. A little bit more, you have an increase again, and then it crashes. And this is because at different levels, these organisms are having different responses. At the very low levels, they're saying, whoa, let's see if we can outrun this damage with cell division. That doesn't work. They reconnoiter. They're then switching over to a lot of excision repair. At some point, that's not going to work, and that's all she wrote. So that's sort of the, the quick thing is that biology is not linear. It's not an engineer. Um, let's just skip that altogether. Um, as has been pointed out before, evolution has a large head start, uh, probably about 3.8 billion years, but now we have more and more data suggesting that there was a hydrological cycle maybe as early as 4.2, 4.3 billion years ago. So life could be even older than 3.8. So I said about 4 billion year head start. And so this really means that life has had a chance to experiment with diverse environments and with diverse solutions. 
and with different types of gene regulation, symbiosis, co-adapted gene complexes, much more time, it, even though it's been so much more inefficient perhaps than a genetic engineer would be, we've had so much more time and so many more organisms in the history of life on Earth that many of these solutions may be out there and there may be multiple solutions. And you know, I was saying to someone the other day, there's almost no mechanism for evolution that you could think of that some crazy organism hasn't done it. It's only really a matter of percentages. So there's huge diversity out there. Furthermore, you've got co-adapted gene complexes. No man is an island. No, no, um, no enzymes an island. No stretch of DNA is an island. Everything in an organism is interacting. And so when you start fiddling with one part, as we're all aware, you may be really tinkering with a whole co-adapted system and it's not able to deal with it. Um, of course, there are huge advantages to synthetic biology um, and that's to many extents the converse of what I, I mentioned for evolutionary biology. Um, and so the question is, is there common ground? And what I'm going to argue is that really natural selection is the generation of heritable variability and then selection among the variants. Darwin didn't say anything about where that variability comes from. Well, I mean, he did say some things. None of them, it turns out, were right. Um, and so it really doesn't matter. What he's looking for is generation of heritable variability. And then his point was natural selection versus artificial selection. Of course, what um, synthetic biologists are doing is, is using artificial selection. So philosophically, it's really not very different from the pigeon breeders that Darwin talked to or the orchid breeders and so on. You're setting up a selective criterion and for applying artificial selection. But it's the same sort of process that we're talking about in evolution. It's only a matter of where the variation's coming from and who's putting on the pressure and what the criterion for success is. So let me finish by saying, let's, let's see what we might be able to look forward to in the next 150 years. Um, obviously, you know, no one can predict even the next 10 years. But this is really only a, a tribute, once again, to the fact that we're coming up to a big year for evolutionary biologists. We're all going to be eating large quantities of cake on February 12th because it'll be Darwin's 200th birthday. And then November 22nd will be, um, in a year, the 150th anniversary of the publication of Origin of Species. And I should just add, um, I found out the other day that the publisher of The Origin of Species was nervous enough that he sent the manuscript out for peer review, and it was completely panned. Um, but he decided, well, this sounds like it might be interesting to get at anyway, and they say it was the best economic decision that he ever made was to publish that, even though he himself wasn't so sure about the content. So for all of us who have had bad peer reviews, um, I remind you, even Darwin got a lousy peer review. Um, so what's going to happen? Well, I'm, I'm quite sure we're going to go well beyond the genetic engineering. We're going to be doing sort of a dial a cell. You're going to be saying, all right, we want this membrane. We want this set of sugars. We want this set of genetic material. We want this. We're going to put that all together and somehow figure out how to get it to work. Um, as Dr. Brenner said, we may have centaurs. We may have um, genetically engineered tissues. Um, I'm sure many people here are seeing Star Trek and you can imagine all sorts of spin-offs that they've already imagined. Um, we may find life beyond Earth. Um, what, will we find it there? Will we then try to change it? Or will we try to make the life beyond Earth? And just to give you an idea, here's some of the places we have not given up on finding life um, beyond Earth, even in our own neighborhood. Um, goes all the way from Venus, where there's still suggestions that there could be organisms living in the clouds above the surface. Earth, we know, that's one, the only good data point we have here. Mars, still a possibility. My understanding is Lloyds of London no longer takes bets. They probably don't take bets on anything right now, but they, they stopped taking bets on life on Mars a couple of years ago. Europa, where you've got the ice-covered water ocean. Uh, we know there are organics there. Um, Titan, frozen organic um, chemistry lab. And, but possibility of liquid water beneath the surface, Enceladus, this little moon of Saturn's that we now know has water that's coming out in a, a cold geyser, leaving a, a trail of oxygen around Saturn. Um, we know that there's life on the spacecraft we send up, possibility on meteorites, asteroids, um, comets. So we, we may be finding life out there. We may do something about it. We may try to terraform these places. We may try to build an environment. Now, I've talked a lot one-dimensionally about life in extreme environments, high temperature, low temperature, pH, and so on. But really, environments are, are very much a multi-dimensional niche space. And not all those niches seem to be filled on Earth. Is it because there's something about this that we cannot 
that life cannot um, deal with? Is, it, is there something about high salt, cold temperature, low pH that's prohibitive for life, or is it just that the environments haven't been there for life to get into? And that's something that where synthetic biology may well be there to fill the gaps. We're certainly very interested in in situ resource utilization. Um, I realize that it, at this point, biofuels may be the equivalent of biofuels, but it may be a totally different e economic situation if you're going to be driving golf carts around um, Mars or you know go deep sea diving Europa and so on. It's going to be much more difficult to take materials with you. Okay, so the conclusions. There's no real conclusions. But to point out um, where we've been in the last half hour, that life goes far beyond what you might have imagined. And so the gene or the tool or really the, um, maybe the paradigm for what you need may well be out there in the biological world already. And it's well worth taking a look beyond, dare I say, E. coli and yeast to see what's out there. Um, how do organisms beat the odds? Sometimes they all do basically the same thing, like low pH organisms all build great proton pumps, and sometimes, like in the case of UV radiation, there are many, many solutions for a similar problem, and there may be backup solutions. Um, I'm going to certainly argue that understanding the diversity of the starting materials, ecosystems, how change works over time, all these wonderful aspects of evolution certainly will enrich synthetic biology um, over its next, dare I say, 150 years. So again, thank you for what was probably a, a very unusual talk for this meeting, but it's been an absolutely fascinating weekend. So thank you. Uh, we're running a little bit late on time through no fault of Lynn, of course. Um, but uh, a couple of questions, please. You actually didn't, you didn't really talk about evolution at all. Everything you said could have been by, by um, what do you call it, intelligent design or whatever. So I was just wondering, um, for people the coffee break. <laughs> that, uh, that have been looking at the evolution of life in these really extreme uh, circumstances, does it appear to be all sort of like normal evolution? Or are there any evidence for extreme evolutionary strategies? For example, if you look in some boiling water pool, um, is there any evidence for gene sharing between diverse organisms? Oh, wow. Um, I have tried three different people to try to get a project going on that. Um, you would think that there would be some environments where it certainly would be much more common. Um, we've done a lot of work on these microbial maps, and you have the physical proximity, so there should be much more gene sharing, but on the other hand, there's a lot of niche partitioning. Um, you do have a situation, of course, in some of these environments where DNA, naked DNA is going to be completely unstable, so if you're looking to pick up genes from the environment, it's going to be much more difficult than others. And so that's a really waffly answer. I, there must be ones that are better than others, and I said, I've been trying to push a couple of different people to get going on this and, and been unsuccessful. Um, in, in terms of is evolution different in a general sort of sense, to me, one of the big differences is, is and maybe that's an artifact of going through evolution courses in school, that the big emphasis the last hundred years has been on um, competition. And that's between organisms, of course, and within a species. And in these extreme environments, the competition is less among organisms and really competition with the environment, which no doubt was really much more the game when life started, because you didn't have that pressure for resources that you were sharing with others, but really to be able to survive in this environment to begin with. And I'd love to talk to you more about intelligent design, if you'd like. <laughs> Okay, uh, no. thank you, Lynn.